and welcome to APS Webinars. The title of today's webinar is Everything You Wanted to Know About Physics Grad School But Were Afraid to Ask. I'm Crystal Bailey and I'll be your host for today's broadcast. Thank you all so much for joining us. APS Webinars are brought to you as a service of the American Physical Society, connecting you with the expertise of individuals who can offer insight into physics careers, educational programs, and professional development for students, working physicists, and educators. Today's presentation features a panel of graduate students and postdocs who will be answering all of your questions about physics graduate school. The discussion today will be moderated by SPS National Office staff and recent physics graduate Elizabeth Hook. The first half of the program will consist of a guided Q&A between our panelists and moderators, and the second half will be an open Q&A with you, our audience. You may ask a question at any time during the presentation, and we will address your questions in the second half. Because of the number of people attending this webinar, we will only be accepting text questions. So if you would like to ask a question, please type it into the questions panel located on the right side of your screen, and we will address it during the Q&A portion of the broadcast. Again, you may ask a question at any time during the broadcast. I also want to remind everyone that a link to the recording of today's presentation will be emailed to you after today's event and will also be made available on the webinar homepage, but please allow 24 hours for upload. Lastly, we encourage you to complete the survey upon exiting so that APS webinars can improve its ability to provide you with these valuable services. And with that, let's get started. Our moderator today is Elizabeth Hook. Originally from Nashville, Tennessee, Elizabeth received her B.S. in physics from Rhodes College in 2011. At Rhodes, Elizabeth conducted research in nuclear physics and also spent a summer doing archaeoastronomy research at a Native American mound complex in western Tennessee. That's pretty cool. Elizabeth is currently working as communications specialist at the SPS National Office in College Park. And with that, I will turn things over to you, Elizabeth. Thanks, Crystal. Um, today we have a wonderful panel of graduate students joining us to talk about how we can prepare for and succeed in graduate programs. Today we have Eric Sorty, a postdoc student at Washington University studying hydrogen storage and metal hydride systems. We have Azade Kivani, a graduate student at Louisiana State University studying ultra high energy cosmic rays. We have Vivian Raymond, a graduate student at Northwestern University, studying gravitational wave signatures in spiraling compact objects. We have Madeline Wade, a graduate student at UW-Milwaukee, working on gaining information about astrophysical systems from gravitational wave signals. And finally, we have Laura Sampson, a graduate student at Montana State University, working on tests for Einstein's theory of gravity using gravitational wave signals. So we want to start by thanking everyone for taking the time to speak with us today. We have a lot of ground to cover, so if you are in the audience and you want to type in your questions during the presentation, we will answer them during the open Q&A period at the end of the webinar. So let's get started. Our first topic today is the grad school application process. First, um, if we can ask our panelists to describe what's involved in the grad school application process and how early we should start thinking about preparing. So do we want to start with Eric? you want to give us a first go? Sure. So I, my personal experience was I began applying. Uh, uh, okay, so many graduate schools, if you don't have a clear idea of where you want to go, if you're going to apply to many, will require the physics GRE, which takes some planning because it's only offered at certain times of the year. Um, I would re probably recommend maybe starting a year out is about what I did. I didn't want to, but by the time I had begun to apply, it looked like I had to sort of start thinking about the, the you know the coming year. So if you want to start entering, say, in 2014, maybe beginning of 2013 is a good time to start thinking about it. Oh, yeah. Um, Laura, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think a year out is about when you should start actually looking into what sort of forms you have to get filled out and um, into when you're going to start taking the, G the GRE. But before that, you're going to need good um, letters of recommendation from people. So if you know you want to go to grad school, you should start sort of currying relationships with professors that you like and 
trying to find research opportunities and that sort of thing. So you should really start thinking about it now. And if you if you want to, there are things you can do to prepare. Yeah, Madeline, do you have something to add? Yeah, some good advice I got when I was going through this process um, was when I picked out the, the schools that I wanted to apply to, I went to their web pages and I found uh, faculty members who were doing research that interested me and then I specifically emailed these faculty members and started a conversation with them. And this allows your application to stand out um, because faculty members can say, oh yeah, I actually talked to that person. And then it also starts developing a relationship in case you do end up going to that school. Well, Eric, did you have something else you wanted to add real fast? I guess Madeline sort of covered it, but I, but from what I've heard from faculty, it's letters of recommendation are sort of the key in these applications more than your grades and your scores and all that kind of stuff. So if you can do undergraduate research or, or get to know someone who's going to be involved in the application process, that's very important. Yeah. Zade, do you have something to add to? Yeah, so uh, some schools uh, need some GRE physics also, so uh, it's good to look through the uh, requirements uh, for each uh, department and then decide what e exams you should take. Um, we've, we've sort of covered this a little bit, but um, playing off of that last question, what factors um, did you all take into account when you started looking for graduate schools? We sort of mentioned um, programs, but Laura, do you have something? Well, I guess the, the two main things for me were I, I sort of knew what research I wanted to do, so there had to be faculty members doing something I was interested in. And I also knew that I wanted to go somewhere I wanted to live. So for me, I needed to be near the mountains. If you like being in the city, then try to go somewhere where there's a big city. You're going to be there for a long time in your early 20s, so you want to be somewhere you can have fun. Definitely. Um, Eric, did you, or sorry, yeah, Eric, do you have something you want to add? In retrospect, it, it, the sort of important thing is who you're working for. I mean, it's really hard to evaluate before you're there and working for them, probably. But if you can get any sense of sort of volume of papers published or how they're respected in the field, um, you know, the, the person who you work for is going to be key, not the name of the school or, or, you know. So if you're really interested in a career in science, that's very important. Yeah. Um, is that it? So yeah, it's important to know uh, what field or what uh, what field of interest uh, you have and uh, with whom you want to work with, and then uh, you just go through the websites and look through um, the faculty members and the research programs, and then decide where you want to go. Yeah, Vivian, do you have something you want to weigh in on too? Yeah, well, we we um, start to to say a bit the same thing. So we've we've all. Uh, had pretty much the same experience and I, I just want to emphasize that as has been said before uh, who you're going to work with is really critical to your uh, grad school and, and should be you should really take in, into account when looking for graduate schools in particular which advisor you're going to spend your life with pretty much for the next five years <laughs> days and nights is, is actually very important maybe to some extent uh, maybe more than you know the the brand name of the school you want to go to, the, the advisor, if you can, in a way, through your undergraduate research or through talking with the grad students already attending the school you're looking to, uh, if you can get an idea of what kind of advisor or who you want to work with and on what subject, uh, that's very, very important. Yeah. Um, one last question in this section that um, we've also touched on a little bit, but um, we had some people ask earlier, how do they make their grad school application look more attractive to recruiters and to make them set apart? I think Eric mentioned undergraduate research. Um, is there anything else that you all think sh they can add? Uh, Madeline? Yeah, uh, there's this fine balance in your application between being too specific and too nonspecific. You want to show specific interest in fields. You don't want to go in not even knowing if you want to do experiment or theory. They'd like you to have some sort of a target. But I see you also don't want to go in with a very specific project in mind that the schools may or may not have the resources or the faculty to complete. So you have to take some time to make sure um, that in your essays that you write with your applications, you're portraying specific interests, but also not too specific. Azadeh, do you have something else? 
Uh, yeah, I wanted to mention that, as Madeline said, um, um, CV and the statement of purpose uh, are very important uh, documents. So try to explain yourself uh, ve very well in those uh, documents. Okay, so we're going to keep on charging ahead and we're going to move on to money. Um, so what options do students have in terms of funding? Um, do they need to work while they're in school or um, will there be funding opportunities through the department? Um, so if any of you all want to speak up on that, uh, Laura, do you want to give us a... Well, I think that it's pretty standard for everyone to have funding all the way through their program. I know my school guarantees you funding for eight years. Most people get an RA after the first year, but some people TA all the way through. It depends how much money your advisor has. But I don't know of anyone who's had to have a job outside of either teaching or research. Mm -hmm. Madeline? Uh, yeah, so to add to that, not only do you get funding, so you get a salary. Granted, it's not very high. Don't expect more than like the mid-20,000 in your salary. Um, but you also get tuition remission, so you're not paying tuition for your school, and that's a big factor. Um, and then on top of that, uh, I. I know at my school, and this could definitely vary, uh, we actually aren't allowed to take a job outside of this. They're expecting you to spend all of your time. It's a full-time program. You're a student 50% and a research assistant or a teaching assistant 50%. So there's uh, oftentimes in your contract, you're not allowed to take another position. Yeah. Zade, do you have something else to say? Yeah, so besides uh, teaching assistantship and research assistantship, there is also the fellowships you can apply for. And if you get them, you don't have to do any te teaching or um, you have some uh, time free for doing your own research without um, any um, uh, special advisor. Okay. Um, so another financial aid question we got was, um, if I'm working on a research grant, when do I need to start working full-time in the lab? and how will that balance out with classes? Uh, Laura? You need to start working full-time in the lab when your advisor wants you to. I mean, there's not like a, <laughs> there's not, there's not a, a written policy in most departments, but if, if you have a, a good advisor, um, they'll give you plenty of time to get your coursework done. And if you have an advisor that's not willing to do that, then you should find a different one. Okay, um, Eric, do you have something to add? I just added that if, if um, you know, this is something you, you really want to do, right, is work in the lab. And if, and if it turns out to be something that you don't want to do, then maybe this isn't sort of the, the right track. If, if uh, I think you should do your homework and then, you know, you go to the lab and this because that's where you want to spend your time. And, and, I, and I really emphasize this because you've got to sort of enjoy this process because uh, we were talking before the panel began. It's not about the money in science. You know, you, you're going to come out making, especially if you go into academia, you know, sort of not as much as you could do without a PhD in other fields. So if 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 um, if it's if it's arduous, if you don't want to go work in the lab, then maybe you know, this is something to rethink. Right. Um, one of the questions we're we're getting a lot in the chats that we had already prepared for is on our next subject um, on coursework. And what courses are typical for first-year physics grad students, and how do they compare to undergrad classes? Uh, Madeline. Sure, I'll take this one. Um, so you basically have the major fields. Um, you'll have electrodynamics, quantum mechanics, classical mechanics, and often a statistical mechanics or thermodynamics. And those are going to be your core courses that you're expected to complete in your first one or two years. Um, and then you'll also be taking some electives. Um, that come either in parallel with your core courses or afterwards, and those will be more targeted towards your research. Um, and how they compare to undergrad, they're a lot harder, I guess would be the way to say that. But that's okay. You get through them. Yeah. Um, you hear a lot about qualifying exams or quals or comprehensive exams. Uh, can somebody explain sort of what that is and if it's something that everyone needs to take or if it's just something that is taken by some schools. Um, Vivian, you want to weigh in? Sure. Uh, so this will, well first, this varies a lot between schools. Uh, you will have to look at exactly on the, on the, on the website of your uh, school of choice and uh, more. They, they all will have uh, slightly differences, but mainly 
uh, the qualifying exam uh, in the first few years of grad school, first or second year, is an exam that all students have to pass one way or another. Some school will require you to pass it for sure after your first year and you just have to succeed. Other schools let you try for a few more years. Some schools will allow you to uh, try for them right at the, at the beginning, right in September when you enter it, just to get an idea and others won't let you do that. Uh, those are um, advanced physics uh, uh, classes. It is possible to do fairly well with uh, very good undergraduate uh, classes, but most people, if not the huge majority of people, do need to take the equivalent graduate level classes in order to, see, to succeed those, uh, those qualifying exams. But really, uh, you should look at the um, uh, the, the uh, the way you, the schools you're going to go to does it and you can actually, for most schools, you can actually find examples of past qualifying exams they've had and you can just, you know, take a look and try for it, see what level it is. Yeah, Zare, do you have something to add? Yeah, so in my school um, the um, uh, questions uh, are mainly in three different parts. One is uh, in classical mechanics and statistical and thermodynamics, so this one was the first part, the second is the quantum mechanics, and the third is electrodynamics. So uh, they say that it's basically in the level of undergrads, but as Vivian said, if you have a very bad and, uh, strong background uh, in physics, you can do it with your undergrad knowledge, but it's um, recommended to take it after the first year or second year of your um, graduate school because then you had uh, you, you can pass all the required courses to be able to solve all the problems. Eric, did you also want to weigh in? I just wanted to add, look, students ask this a lot and just to be specific, usually um, if you do E&M quantum mechanics, if you can understand sort of the Griffiths books on those, um, like the StatMech on your level of Rife and maybe like Goldstein for classical mechanics, then it'll get you pretty far in most of these qualifying exams. Alright, okay, Madeline? Yeah, I guess I'm sort of jumping ahead to the next question a little with my response as well. But um, you do typically get more than one chance to take this exam. So if you don't pass the first time, which um, at my school everyone was saying, you know, you take it after your first year. At my school they actually make you take it before you take any graduate classes whatsoever. So a lot of people don't pass the first time. But you get uh, two or three or sometimes more than that tries. It is important to pass it, but it's, it's not a one shot or nothing. Yeah. Um, are there are there resources available for students to prepare, or is it just you take your classes and then you have to go straight into your quals? Laura, do you want to weigh in? Sure. I'm, there's definitely resources. These schools don't they don't want you to fail your comp or your qual. So there's like um, someone was saying, most schools have old exams up online that you can use to study and professors will talk to you about what they think is going to be on there, we might hold study sessions or whatever. They're not, they're not out to get you, they just want to make sure that you're learning what you need to be learning. Yeah. Um, so in addition to, to passing quals, um, we're going to move on to research and advising. Um, earlier in, in the webinar someone said that you know, choosing a research advisor is extremely important. Um, you recommended talking with them, but what other advice would you give for choosing a research advisor? So what would you look for? Um, those sorts of things. Azada, Day, do you want to add something? Yeah, I think uh, one thing which is very important is to um, choose the advisor uh, very, um, uh, very um, carefully because you want to work for four or five or more years with that advisor. So uh, what I recommend is not to choose the advisor um, um, in the first semester, but go to different seminars and colloquiums and talks and read about their works, read the papers, and then decide who you want to work with. Okay. Um, Eric, do you want to add something? So, I mean, to, to be very specific about this choosing advisor thing, you're not going to probably understand their papers, and it's really hard to evaluate as an incoming graduate student if it's good work or not or anything. What, what, what's very important is that you can get along with them. So I think maybe the first metric is just to meet with them and try to work in their lab a little bit even for free and just see if, like, the dynamic works okay. 
because that's really sort of important. And then talking to the graduate students around and making sure that this person is doing good work. I mean, they will know, the graduate students will know, um, especially those in other groups, and uh, that's one way to start. Yeah. Um. So would, would any of y'all recommend, you know, if you're starting to look at grad schools and um, you find an advisor that looks interesting, do, would you just shoot them an email and say, hey, I'm thinking about going to grad school? Um, do you have any recommendations, I guess, on first contact? Uh, Laura. I mean, yeah, I, I emailed a couple people before I applied to grad school and they were they were friendly and sent me some papers that they had talked about, and we talked about their research a little bit. But um, if, if you try to contact someone and they're kind of a jerk about it, that means you probably don't want to work for them anyway. So you might as well try to make contact. Yeah. Eric? A lot of professors are really busy. And, and even if they're good to work for, maybe they won't get back to you. Um, I agree. If they're being jerks, then maybe you should move on. But, but if they don't get back to you, you know, you can show up at the school if you can and talk to the graduate students. And they, they'll even show you the labs and everything. And that's another way in if you can't get a hold of the professor. Yeah, their current grad students are probably the best people for you to talk to because they know how it is to work with them. Yeah. Um, so. While you're a grad student and you're working on experimental research, um, when do experimentalists usually begin working on their thesis? So the, the follow-up to that is, do students generally you know, start working on it first, or do they get to, to, to work on smaller projects or sample some of their advisors' other projects? Um, and how does this thesis work start? Madeline, you want to say something? So I'm not an experimentalist. I think we might only have one of those here, which I think is fair. But I can say for theory computational work, um, I think it's probably the same idea. Yeah, you usually start with a smaller project that could start as early as your first year or as late as, I'd say, by your second year. You should be at least engaging with an advisor. Um, and then you slowly build up. You see what interests you. And then you just kind of, I guess, go with the flow from there until you figure out what you want your bigger thesis project to be. Is that it? So in my first year, I um, went only to the group meetings of my advisor to just get familiar with uh, the research they were doing. And in the second year, I started to um, read some papers and um, learn some uh, programming, coding softwares, and all those stuff. So basically, I started my um, thesis project in my, per in my third year. Okay. Um, so do any of y'all have advice on writing your thesis? Or Vivian, you want to weigh in? Yeah, uh, so it, it, it varies a lot, of course, between advisors. And, and for instance, in my case, uh, my very first summer at, at the university I'm at, even before I actually officially joined the, the graduate school, I was already working on what would come to be my thesis. But that's... Uh, not really, in, in most cases, uh, as far as I can tell, it's not really a problem in the sense that at the very end, uh, you write in your thesis, you will write whatever you did. You will write, if it's several projects and they don't match together very well, that's okay. You can have several chapters of your thesis. Uh, usually it's nice to have one big project that goes on, but it doesn't mean that the smaller uh, projects at the beginning uh, are, are a waste of time or, or are, are not interesting. It, they, they help you in a lot of ways to learn how to do the right thing. And uh, advices to, to write your thesis uh, from, that's a very personal experience, but I would say just start as early as possible and then earlier. Yeah. Does anyone else have any general thesis advice? Eric, yeah? Uh, this is something that just have to sort of sit down and do. I, um, I like what, what Vivian said. It's um, it, uh, my personal thesis had three or four different projects in it, sort of one main one, but three or four that were also of that par. And uh, I sort of started writing my beginning of my what turned out to be my last year, and um, you know probably spent four or five months writing really hard for the first draft, and then maybe the next six months revising it. And uh, yeah, it's just something you just got to get through. Um, and your advisor will give you time off in the lab, and it's and it's arduous, but it's, it's useful and it's fun. 
So how long did it take everyone to complete their thesis? Um, Eric? Um, so uh, that took probably, all told, maybe six months. OK. Um, do you, is that just for the writing or for the research or for everything? Well, like many of these things, the actual research that went into the thesis was probably done in the course of a week, but the uh, the uh, experience took oh, several years. So the writing is what I was referring to. Yeah. Okay. Vivian, you want to jump in? Yeah. So there is a there is some variations on, on people writing thesis, and for instance, all thesis begins with a one or two chapters of introductory materials that technically you can write during your first or second year, as soon as you know roughly what you're going to work on, you could start writing them. And so in this most extreme, uh, you can spend most of your PhD writing your thesis. And if you do it you know, slowly, chapter by chapter, and you can just write everything. And at the very end, uh, you'll just add the results from yeah, that, that last week where at least everything worked after those seven years of, of working. But on the other hand, you might also have um, uh, some depending on your advisor, depending on your field in particular and how things work, uh, you might be working on a lot of projects and publishing papers very regularly. And at the very end, you remember that you need to write a thesis and you just staple as many papers together as possible, write some something, and that can be done in a few weeks and maybe a, a one or two months. So th there is some variations there. But I think, uh, as Eric said, uh, you know, five, six months is, is Roughly, what you what you do? You you start writing your thesis in January to be done in June, ish. Yeah. Um, so, I just sorry, I had a bit of an exciting connection problem. So, if any of the rest of you want to weigh in, uh, feel free. Um, um. Elizabeth, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of breaking in here, but we did get one question about what, what if you get stuck with the school or professor or project that you hate, or hate maybe a strong word, and it kind of ties in with the advice for problems with the research advisor. Does, does anyone have anything to say about any advice for that situation? Oh, maybe we're just supposed to jump in here. Um, <laughs> Uh, I would say don't stay in that situation. A lot of people like to avoid confrontation or, for example, if you have a problem with your research advisor, you'd rather like, you know, sit back and avoid confronting him about it, him or her about it, and just carry on. That's way worse in the end. The like two minutes or 30 minutes or however long it ends up being of confrontation saves you, you know, five years of pain. So I would say either transfer schools if you hate the school, change research advisors, Tell your research advisor you hate your project, but don't just accept being miserable. Exactly. If you're if you're having a particular problem with your advisor, first try talking to them about it. And if if they don't want to change anything, then you can certainly find a new advisor. There's no reason to be miserable for seven years. Okay. Um, sorry about that little glitch. Um, so, yes. Um, the the next thing we have up is just general questions. We're we're starting to to wind down with our um, regular Q and A, but this is the time if any of our panelists have any general advice for students thinking about graduate school. Um, sort of, you know, if you could if you had to do it all over again. What things would you change? What would you um, have done the same? So Madeline, you want to weigh in? Uh, sure. The advice I always give people is that it is very hard. So um, you will probably be discouraged, especially your first and second year when you're doing a lot of intensive classes. Um, the classes are difficult. You don't really have much time for anything else. So that's normal. Um, you make it through. The research part is fun. And you basically just get through the classes to get to the research. The classes can be interesting. It's more just the jam-packedness of the first few years that is a little crazy. Yeah. Vivian, what do you think? Yeah, I was, uh, I'm actually going to echo uh, uh, a comment by Madeline uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, if I had to change a few things, I would actually 
have focused uh, more my first year on really getting those those qualifying exam and classes out of the way and starting writing my thesis way sooner than I did. But overall, the grad school experience is very much a learning experience, and so there are some things that you won't do perfectly, but that's part of the learning experience. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we have a very uh, chatty group. They have lots of questions. So we're going to move on to some of the questions that have been asked so far. Um, Eric Johnson has asked, with all things being equal, do grad committees tend to prefer graduates of liberal, liberal arts schools or larger universities? Uh, Madeline, you want to answer that one? Yeah, I came from a small liberal arts school, so I can I can talk to that. Maybe someone else who came from a bigger research school can answer to the other part. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to coming from a small liberal arts school. The advantages um, would be that you can develop close relationships with your professors and get those really good letters of recommendation. You have um, a broader, uh, maybe not necessarily, but you are required to have a broader education. Um, and you will hopefully have honed your writing and presentation skills um, largely. The disadvantage would be that you do not have, if it's a college, you do not have graduate. Hi, graduate I'm Hispanic for realwomeninphiladelphia.com. Oh, I guess there was an interruption there. You don't have um, graduate classes available to you, so that's a disadvantage because it's very helpful to take graduate classes before you actually go into graduate school or at least sit in on them. Um, Laura, do you also want to weigh in? Yeah, so I went to a, a big research university for undergrad, and I'd say about three quarters of the grad students at my school went to little liberal arts colleges, and I have found similar things to what Madeline was saying. My, uh, my physics background is more advanced, but they had chances to get closer relationships with their professors, so probably had better letters of recommendation. I had more opportunities to do research and that sort of thing. Really. I mean, none of us have been on grad panels letting in students, so we don't know for sure. But I think that it really just comes down to the individual student less than the school that they went to. All right. Um, the next question we have is someone that's entering her, first, her fifth year at UCLA and is planning to apply to grad school in the fall. And there's a, however, I have a 3.0 GPA. Would you recommend doing a master's program before applying to a doctorate program? to be more competitive for top tier schools? So Eric, do you want to pick up that question? I mean, the, the, the people do look at the grades. Um, I, when I hear professors talk, they'll say, you know, this guy looks really strong, but it looks like, you know, he got mostly Bs, so, and uh, so you can apply, but I think you'll be, um, you know, you got to get the grades up frankly, if you want to do a top tier school. Mm -hmm. So you would recommend doing a master's program at Gateway Grades Up? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Azadeh, do you want to weigh in? Uh, yeah, uh, so I think it very much depends on the school. So um, in some schools, the um, scores uh, of the GRE and um, some um, GRE physics or GRE general are very important. In other schools, the research you have done in undergrad is very important to the uh, professors. In some other schools, uh, the GPA is very important. So, um, I mean, you can apply, go ahead and apply for some master's program and PhD program. But it's good to ask uh, graduate students, the current graduate students in that certain school you want to apply to uh, make sure what uh, the requirements are. Yeah, Laura, do you want to add? Um, Kind of echoing a little bit, I think that it sounds like applying for a master's program first is probably a good idea, but it, it really depends what you mean by top tier, because I know some of the schools that get just absolutely inundated with applications are just going to throw away half the stack for GPA just so they don't have to look at all of them. So it really it depends what you're trying to do. If you know you want to work with a specific person and if you've been in contact with them, then they can certainly move your application towards the top of the stack, but it sounds like a master's program would be a good idea. Yeah, Eric, do you want to weigh in again? Uh, let me just add one thing. Don't discount, I mean, we don't all have to go to Harvard for grad school if, if it's like academia that you want to do. Um, I guess what I've heard from faculty members is that it's not that important where graduate school is done in so much as um, you do get a PhD and you work for someone good 
and then go do a postdoc at it um, again for someone good, then um, you're all set as well as anyone else. So um, if your grades are low, in, in particular in physics classes and chemistry classes, in the hard science classes, if it's because of other things, it's probably less critical. But from what people say, if, you know, if, you're, if you've sort of gotten C's and B's in, in E and M and quantum in the hard courses um, and, and can get into something that you would consider not as a lead of school, that's not going to be that bad for you and, and on the contrary may get you a degree where you may not be able to do it otherwise. All right. Um, Vivian, you want to weigh in too? Uh, just uh, one quick uh, uh, a quick comment there, so that I can read my personal case, uh, uh, not having studied at all my undergraduate degrees, neither in physics nor in the U.S., but my, my grad school applications really didn't have any grades. I didn't have the, the GRE or anything. My grad school application didn't have any grades for uh, schools to base themselves on, and I only got into the school uh, I'm, I got into just out of uh, recommendation letters and having worked a bit for one of the professors there who was able to make sure my application got looked at. So if you have a great issue, and indeed, as, as uh, uh, was said before, uh, most of the top tier schools will just you know, put, a, put a cut on the GRE just out of uh, management reasons because they just cannot look at all the applications. If that's your case, then you probably uh, need to, if, if you really want to get into one of those schools, you need to get one extra thing that makes you your application pop out and so a recommendation from a professor working there or having worked with a professor there is probably ideal and getting a master's degree might be the convenient or best way in order to, to get that on your application. Right. Um, speaking of applications, we had someone ask about CVs and someone mentioned it earlier and the question is how heavily will various schools weigh a CV? Um, Alan, you want to jump in? Sure. Uh, that's a little bit of a hard question for us to answer since we are graduate students and not graduate like uh, panel. Like we don't let people into grad school. But I can tell you that I was told CVs are certainly important, um, and they will look at them. I think it's uh, the easiest thing for graduate panels to look at because it's short and like laid out. So I would. They make your CV organized and really sell yourself on it, sell your research, sell the relevant things about grad school. I don't think they care about you working at the sandwich shop, but like your research and things like that. But I don't really know because I've never admitted anyone to graduate school. Yeah, Vivian, you want to jump in? Yeah, so uh, of course, obviously, every school will have different uh, ways to do things. But usually what happens is that uh, when applications come around, uh, a given school, a given department in school will have all of its uh, faculty meeting and they will have a um, hiring committee formed that just look at every, uh, look through every pals, try to start by uh, reducing the number and then once the first cut is made, they try to look at the uh, several things in details. And in short, um, your grades is not something you can change and even the presentation of your grades, it's all being done for you. So your CV is really there to show what you have more than what you potentially have more than other people in particular. You might know that uh, multidisciplinary tends to be a word that is uh, thrown around academia quite a lot. And if you can put that on your CV, uh, that, that's pretty good. Yeah. Laura, you want to weigh in? Um, yeah, I was going to say that the, the CV does seem like it's pretty important, and most schools have resources to help you put one together. So you might be thinking, oh, I don't really have that much research experience. I don't know what kind of skills I can put down on here. But if you go meet with someone whose job it is to help you with these things, they can help you sort of pull out of what experience you have, what might be relevant, and what would look good, and how to present it in a good way. Right. Um, one question we've gotten. Oh, Eric, do you want to jump in before we move on? Sure. I, I keep giving all this advice, and as I think back, like I submitted an application with no undergraduate research experience, no degree in physics, and, uh, and not knowing anyone at the school that I went to um, apply for. So it can be done otherwise, um, though all these things that we're telling you are good to have. Um, if you don't have them, it's not the end of the world. Perhaps um, still apply if it's what you think you want to do, and um, you know, hopefully you have the grades or the test score or something to, to back you up, and, and you may still get it. Right. Um. 
so we have a lot of theoretical physicists on the call. So how is training for theoretical physics different from experimental physics? Uh, Madeline, you want to answer that question? Uh, sure. So for the theory, well, I guess I and I think other people here are more theory and computational physics. Uh, the big difference I've heard comes in the money. That hasn't, uh, what I mean by that is um, whether you're able to get funding to have a research assistant, assistantship so you get to spend all of your time doing your research, which helps you graduate faster or whether you have to spend your time being a teaching assistant and doing your research on the side because there is no research grant. That's really not relevant for all theory areas. Like, for example, I work with a, I do the computational work for a large experiment, and that large experiment has plenty of money. So I've never had an issue not having an RA. But I think it's often um, the big difference is this line between where the money goes. All right. Laura, you want to add to that? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I also do mostly computational stuff, um, but I'm not involved in large experiments, so I have been teaching half-time the whole time I'm here, and I probably will until I graduate. But the, the big key, I guess, is that theory, some people really do just do theory, and they just do math on the whiteboard, and that's cool. But most people who are theorists really do a lot of computational work, so if you want to do theory, you should learn to code. Are <laughs> <laughs> um, so another question we got was, are theoretical grad positions more competitive than experimental positions? Um, so Eric, do you want to weigh in on that one? As the only apparently non-theorist, maybe I will. Uh, what I saw in graduate school is that um, the theoretical professors had fewer graduate students. They have less money. Um, these are difficult sort of things to do, as an experimentalist I say this, um, but the, the research collaboration, the, the experimental groups will have five or six graduate students and uh, a theoretical professor will maybe have one, possibly two. And so yes, they're, they're much, I think they're more difficult to get into, um, just for the simple numbers reason. Right. Um, so another question we got um, is about international students, and is it harder for international students to enter graduate schools in the United States with funding, and do international students need to be doing anything extra when they apply? Um, Zade, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, I guess because I'm an international student, I can answer this question. Uh, no, I don't think so. If it's, I don't think if it's harder. Um, so the only thing that um, you have to have in addition is the TOEFL score. Uh, or the IELTS, some places um, also accept IELTS to score test. Um, but um, no, nothing more you have to do. Uh, the only problem is that when you are outside of the country, it's usually harder to see the cities or the schools or visit them before you apply. So um, basically, um, you can just Google and ask people instead of visiting. Or if you can do visit, it's recommended to go to that school and talk to people. But um, no, I don't think it's harder. Okay, Vivian, you want to add something? Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I completely agree with uh, Azadeh. The, the, it is not harder for international students to get in. There is maybe a slightly smaller, bigger burden in the sense that, well, they have to well, know what GRE is and, and look up the schools they, they can't visit, and maybe they, don't, they won't, won't be able to know exactly all the details. But really, in your applications, uh, it's it's... It's, it's definitely not harder, and actually, um, uh, do, doing your applications, uh, academia is a fairly international world. Academia in the United States, at the very least, is a fairly international environment, and there is support. Uh, the universities have no uh, uh, how to, to um, uh, know how all the, the uh, complications that might come from uh, international students, and they will have support structures and an international office that you can uh, um, talk to in terms of the application process uh, I, as far as I could tell I didn't see any kind of difficulty from being foreigner. Right. Laura do you want to add something to you? Yeah so I'm, I'm not an international student so you should take what they say more seriously than what I say but I, I know that the average GRE score for international students is somewhat significantly higher than the average score for U.S. students that are admitted. 
to various universities. But I don't know if that's because they only admit people with higher scores or if people just tend to do better. So. Great. Madeline, you want to jump in as well? Yeah, I think so. The, playing off of what Laura just said, I think a big difference is education systems are different in different countries. Um, our undergrad education does not cover as much content as many international undergraduate educations. Um, so that might mean you have this similar benefit where you've seen graduate material. If you go to a U.S. graduate school, you'll have seen U.S. graduate material prior to attending the school because your school system is different. So in that sense, it would actually be helpful because <laughs> some of it would be review, whereas the U.S. students, since their undergrad just doesn't have as much content in it, they'll be seeing that for the first time. Right. But it is also true, I know, that, that universities like to have lots of domestic students because the funding sources are easier to come by. So, I mean, it's, there's some give and take. Yes. Um, this, is, this is a question I'm looking forward to hearing the answer to. Um, how much free time do you have during grad school, and how much sleep do you get? Any of you want to admit to any of those answers? Um, oh, all of you. Okay. Uh, Madeline, you want to start? I think I saw your yeah. name go past. It's a, sort of a rite of passage, I guess. Um, <laughs> your first, when you're taking classes, you have, um, I hate to say it, but essentially no free time. Um, you really, really don't do anything else, and you don't sleep that much. It depends on how good your time management is. I mean, there are nights where you don't sleep at all if you left your problem set till the last minute, which I will admit I have done on more than one occasion. But if you plan well, you can, you know, get six, seven, eight hours of sleep. When you're in research, so after you get through the classes phase, you really can work a nine to five job type schedule. You work more than 40 hours a week, but you're more flexible in that you can sleep and you can have hobbies and you can be a happier person. Not that you're not happy doing problem sets until three in the morning, right? Um, Vivian, you want to weigh in? Uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, most, most of what I wanted to say has already been said, but it is true that after the classes part where, well, it's just classes and you are, you are going to grad school, you're going to go pro probably, especially in physics, uh, uh, do s studies for the rest of your life and you will um, you'll keep learning and so you have to enjoy, you, you have to be able to enjoy doing that anyway. And afterward, the research phase, you end it a little more flexible and sometimes you're going to work 30, 50 hours in, in one day and sometimes you will just take the day off because, well, the experiments are not working anyway. And but uh, it is definitely not a nine to five job. That that that's for sure. Uh, you will have weeks where you are busy beyond you thought was possible, and weeks where actually it's okay. That is after the classes. Um, Laura, you want to weigh in too? Uh no, it's pretty much all been covered. The first couple okay. of years while you're in classes suck, and then your time is kind of your own. You have to get research done, but it's really your own schedule. Yeah. Um, Azade, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I think you can have fun, but the type of fun is different. So maybe um, sometimes uh, just um, hanging out with some um, physics students or physicists um, is a um, fun thing, but on the other side, you, you might just um, do a lot of physics discussions while you are doing uh, a get-together. So um, also going to conferences and summer schools, they're all both um, some fun and some work. So that's what I want to say. Right. Um, so we have another question that we've sort of addressed a little bit, but um, in y'all's opinion, do you think that committees care very much about non-physics related achievements? For example, an honors degree requiring various philosophy and writing courses. That sort of touches on the, the liberal arts perspective. But uh, Vivian, you want to take that one? Yeah, so uh, maybe other panelists will have uh, uh, other things to say. but. Um, after you have all of what they are looking for in the sign the hard sciences and physics and math and all your scores, then yes, those type of things are very good and look very good in your application. However, that's after you pass the scientific bar, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we've been, Crystal wants to field a few careers questions. 
You want to take it away, Crystal? <clears throat> yes. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Um, so I just I wanted to kind of open this up because um, a, a great deal of folks have actually been asking about physics careers, and um, I definitely want to get a sense from the panelists uh, what they are hoping to do. So so why don't I ask you all first, um, what, what are your plans, your career plans for your next steps? Eric, you want to go first? Eric, are you there? Hmm. Sorry, should I unmute before I start talking? Is that is that what that you help? <laughs> <laughs> I guess as I'm closest to this, um, I, I thought I, I might. I always wanted to work in sort of renewable energy was my idea. Um, there's, you know, we have this world to save after all, and that seems like there's some money going that direction. So I did not end up um, being able to do that in graduate school, um, but uh, was able to find a postdoc in that area. And so I think that um, that's my intention. Um, it could be in academia or in national lab or in industry. None of that's been decided, but uh, that's kind of what I'm planning. Okay. Maddie, uh, would you like to say something? Sure. Um, I've really enjoyed teaching. You do get to do some teaching in graduate school when you're on a teaching assistantship. And like we said, that depends on uh, research funding, how long you do that. But I've really enjoyed my teaching experiences, and I've decided I want to pursue that. So I'm going to be, hopefully, um, going down the track of a smaller teaching institutions like the small liberal arts schools. Okay. Azadeh, you have a response? Yeah, so I always uh, wanted to be a um, university professor and stay in academia, and still my plan is to do that. But uh, I might change my uh, plan in future. No one knows. But um, in the first, um, uh, the first um, plan is probably to apply for a postdoc after my graduation, and then hopefully I can get to the academy. Good. Uh, anyone else have anything they want to add before I go on my uh, tirade or whatever? <laughs> Not my tirade. It looks like Vivian wants to jump in. Okay. Uh, yeah. No. Just just to say, and uh, personally, I. I I wanted to go to grad school and do a PhD to figure out if this whole academia thing was for me or not. I had worked a bit in the industry before, and I was just curious, and I thought, you know, doing research uh, at the PhD level would give me an idea, and I actually quite like it, so I'm going to stick to it, and I'm uh, going to go to a, to a postdoc I had for, for next year, and then probably the year after that, and the year after that, and the year after that, and so on. <laughs> Maddie, did you have one other thing to add, or...? Yeah, I just wanted to make that comment that we had actually talked about before the webinar. Um, but it's important, I maybe should have said this in another section, um, ma many of you might not have heard of what a postdoc is or a postdoctoral position. It means exactly what it says, it's the job you get after you get your doctorate. Um, and depending on what you want to do, you may take, may take you a very long time to get the job you want and you have to be very patient. For example, if you would like to become a faculty member at a research one institution, you may be doing as many as six years of postdocs after you graduate from graduate school. So that's usually one to three year positions, and then every one to three years you're moving to a new one, new one, new one, until you get accepted to a tenure track faculty position, or maybe you get a visiting professor position in the meantime. If you want to go to a teaching institution, that can be minimized to maybe one or two, two years of postdocs instead of the longer period. Maybe Crystal will talk more about what goes into all of that. Yeah, yeah, great. But that, that's a really great uh, kind of summary of the situation. So, so the first thing I would want to say, and the reason I'm busting in here is just that I work on uh, all kinds of programs that are directed towards educating undergraduates about career paths in physics. That's kind of like what I do at ATF. So the first thing you should all know is that, in fact, about half of all bachelors who graduate with physics degrees go into the workforce which might surprise you. And in fact, um, of those who go on to grad school and eventually get PhDs, the majority, the vast majority actually, don't get academic jobs. Um, students often see their professors and advisors as, it, it makes sense that they think that that's the main, most common track, because that's what they actually see. But in fact, um, when they go into to the workforce, uh, about half who go after their bachelor's degrees, will get engineering and computer science jobs. 
And they actually get paid. There's a wonderful salary graph that is circulating around. Um, the median salary starting for physics bachelors in these fields is about 50K, which is not bad. Um, and then of those who actually go and get their master's or PhDs, they will often go into uh, STEM-related areas. Often their job titles will have engineering in the title, but they're doing research and development at companies. They are managing. Uh, a lot of physics masters will go into very, very high um, management positions and PhDs. Um, actually, one person, I think this is how I'll just wrap up that comment. One guy I talked to gave this really great um, description. In any given company, there will be a job for a physics bachelor, a physics master, and a physics PhD. Physics bachelor might be doing some coding, some computer modeling. Maybe they work in the IT department. Maybe they're helping to kind of solve problems and, and write code and uh, things like that, or they're technicians. The master's degree, physics master's degree, will be managing that group of undergraduates who's doing that work and will be reporting to higher up. And the physics PhD will be in the research and development department coming up with new processes, new products, things like that. So there are actually roles for physicists at all degree levels in industry. And uh, you can write me an email, bailey at APS.org, if you want more information on that. And that's all I have to say about that. Take it away, Elizabeth. Um, so we're about out of time for the official webinar. Um, however, if you want to stick around, we can do some additional Q&A after Chris will make some more announcements. Um, but thanks once again to our great panel speakers. Uh, for joining us, and now Crystal gets the, the control back. I get to gab at you again. <laughs> um, so so as, as Elizabeth mentioned, we are going to have uh, our speakers around for about 10 minutes or so of additional Q&A because there are so many questions that have come in. So if you can, please stick around. But before you sign off, I want to make sure you know one thing, which is next month we are doing a webinar on acing your physics GRE tips and strategies. Um, we will be joined by GRE preparation course leader Jeremy Dodd from Columbia University, who will describe content and format of the physics GRE subject test and will provide advice and tips on how to prepare and offer test-taking strategies. The webinar will be on Tuesday, July 17th at 3 p.m. Eastern, and you can register for it by going through the APS webinar site. Just click on the link and register for the webinar just like you did this one. So we hope you'll take advantage of that opportunity and sign up today. Also, for those of you who are signing off now, uh, you can follow up with speakers. You can send an email to webinars at APS.org. We can forward your questions to the speakers for comment. Um, slides of the presentation will be available, though I'm not sure if that would be very helpful. But the recording will also be available on the webpage for this webinar. Lastly, to help us to continue to develop uh, quality presentations, Please help us by taking a moment to complete the short survey as you exit. And that wraps up today's event, and we hope you'll join us next time. So Elizabeth, uh, take it away. <laughs> There's yeah, so a few more questions. Um, so what happens if you don't get into a grad school? What do people do before they start applying again? Um, do any of you want to weigh in on that one? Um, Laura, you want to start out? Sure. Um, I know if so, if you don't get into a PhD program, it's often easier to get into a master's program, or a lot of people retake the GRE for a higher score. That's, I had a few friends who had to do that after undergrad. That's fine. Yeah. Eric, you want to add something? Yeah, if you really don't know um, why you didn't get in, then I would just go talk to the people at the school. Um, the committee is more than happy to tell you. Uh, maybe you didn't make the cut for the for the GRE, for the GPA. Uh, maybe there were other reasons that you can rectify, and I, they'd be happy to tell you. I don't think there's any reason why they wouldn't. So just go ask why you didn't get into the specific school and um, go from there. So we've got another question that I've heard before, but... Um Someone has heard that a dual major in physics and math is particularly required. Um, is that true for all fields of physics? Uh, Madeline, you want to take that one? 
So I don't know about required, um, but your physics courses are math intensive. I mean, that is the language we use to communicate physics. Um, so you will, I mean, many, um, I don't know about many. I guess I can only speak to my program. My program has a math methods course that you take as one of your core courses. So if you didn't have the math as an undergrad, you'll see it. Or one of the wonderful things about being physicists is that we can, or at least we learn to teach ourselves, so you can also teach yourself the math you'll need to know. But certainly, you do math it's a lot. Laura, you want to add? Yeah, so in most areas of physics, the type of math that you'll need isn't the type of math that you'll learn in sort of like um, high-level pure math programs. Uh, if you're going to be like a really serious theorist, then, then some of the like sort of analysis classes that you take might be more useful. But, but in most areas, you need like numerical techniques and ways of solving actual problems as opposed to sort of like group theory kind of stuff. So a double major might look good, but it's certainly not required for anything. Right. Can anyone address the National Science Foundation Graduate Student Fellowships? Things like what it takes to apply, deadlines, et cetera. Um, uh, Lori, you want to field that one? I think that you need to have a really good idea of what your project is going to be when you apply for that. Um, mm -hmm. So if you've already been in contact with an advisor and you know what you're going to be working on, then it's something that you can apply for in your first year, but I think a lot of people apply for it in their second year. Yeah. Vivian, you want to add on? Yeah, so I, I don't have uh, much experience directly with that uh, fellowship since it's limited to uh, US citizens, actually. But uh, it is indeed a fellowship based on the research project. So you need to have a good idea of your research projects, so being able to write it down, have an advisor name for it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Eric? Uh, only to say that if you can get them, they look really good, um, I think, for postdoc positions and if you want to continue on in academia. Um, the ability to get your own funding is very, very attractive to anyone who you're ever going to work for. And so if you can pull that off, that's good. I, have a, I applied for um, an NSF grant as a postdoc for um, a renewable energy grant they have and didn't get it. So you're talking to someone who's only failed at the process, but I think that if you can get them, this is very positive. Right. Um, another question we have well, is, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, I should have, uh, uh, it, it's, it's true that you can't apply to them uh, uh, as, a, as a finishing grad student. You have to apply it within the first three years of grad school. But usually three years is enough to, for you to know who you're going to end up work with and on what. Yeah. Um, so another question we had is, would you say that the actual uh, research work is more solitary or group-based? And for example, how many people do you interact with on your research on a daily, day-to-day -day basis? Madeline, you want to field that one? Yeah, it's very group-based, at least for me. I mean, I, you're const I, I work in a collaboration. Granted, my collaboration is about 800 people, but even so, there's smaller working groups within the collaboration, and many people in my department work on what I do. So I'm finding myself constantly talking to people, if not in person, by email or on telecons. Maybe someone who works in a smaller field or at least a smaller collaboration could comment on how that is. All right, Eric, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, I have the opposite experience. In a small um, experimental group, I mostly did my own thing. Once in a while, I would do a project with another graduate student, but I spend weeks and weeks, you know, basically not talking to anyone but my advisor uh, about my work. So it, it, that mine's very solitary. Is that you. it? Oh, sorry. Um, I think it's very important to collaborate with people, even if you don't have any anyone working uh, on the same thing in your department or in your group. It's good to email people and uh, work and collaborate with other um, graduate students or professors or postdocs in other institutes. And uh, also, um, even if not on your own research, it's always good to talk to older graduate students in your department about your work and other postdocs and professors. Right. Um, another question we have is, if you get stuck with a school professor or a project you hate, can you transfer to a different school and do you have to start over completely? Um, do any of you want to 
to, to take that one. Uh, Laura? I don't know anyone who has transferred because they hated what they were doing, but I know a couple people who um, failed their comps twice and so had to start over somewhere else. Most places will transfer at least some of your credits, but you'll probably have to redo um, some stuff. Right. Madeline? So I guess two points. One to play off of what Laura just said. If you do fail your comps or your qualifying exam, you have a few options. One would be to transfer. Another would be to receive your master's degree and then go try to do something from there. Um, and then to answer the other question, um, I do actually know someone in my program here who did transfer, not because they hated what they were doing, but because they met an advisor who works in my department who they really liked and they really wanted to work with. And so they transferred because of that. So it's possible and doable, and I think most of his credits transferred. Vivian, you want to add something? Uh, yeah, a quick one. Uh, it, is, it is possible. It is not always a good thing, uh, but it is possible. There is one uh, fairly straightforward way. Uh, you, you probably we haven't uh, explained in more detail, but you understand by now that grad school ref roughly is divided into two phases. The first one is taking the classes, getting the qualifying exam over with, and the second phase would be research. Uh, it is since some schools will allow you to take the qualifying exam as soon as you enter uh, with them before your before even your first year is fairly straightforward in some cases to uh, go to a school, get the classes there, realize you don't like it or you don't find anyone you like, and apply to another school, get in, and there you can, if you manage to uh, succeed the qualifying exam right away, then you haven't lost any years, uh, uh, pretty much. And that, some people do that, it happens sometimes for geographic or personal reasons, they have to move. Uh, if it's after you started doing research with someone, and you realize this will not work out and you have to change, then if, it, if you really, really cannot make it work out, you might end up lose uh, one or two years towards the completion of your PhD, but it's anyway uh, uh, still learning and, and experiences that might be useful later on. Definitely. Um, one question we have is, how can you convince a grad school that you are really interested in a specific field if you don't have the opportunity to actually work in that field beforehand? Eric, you want to jump in? Uh, so this was my experience. Um, my bachelor's was in finance, and I came to, the, to go do graduate school with very little sort of preparation, um, trying to convince people that I was interested in it and was serious about doing it. And, um, the I think the key for me was just to go and, and to meet with the guy and so you build some sort of personal relationship with the person who would then be who would eventually be my advisor. And um, that's all you've got at that point, I think, is to get someone to advocate for you on your side. And that um, just piece, talking face to face I think is probably the most uh, straightforward way to do that. Madeline, you wanna add something? Oh no, Eric said it all. <laughs> Um, well, that's, um, Crystal, do you, do you think we have enough, um, more time for a few more questions, or do we need to go ahead and close out? Uh, it's up to you. I mean, uh, we could probably sign off now. I think, I think that we've, uh, answered a lot of them. Of course, there's still more ones. And, and actually, Joseph Park just asked, if my questions don't get answered here, someone said I can follow up. So what you should do, uh, if you, if you feel like, um, we, we need more follow-up, then what you can do is email your question to webinars at APS.org, and I will either try to answer it or I will forward it to the panel and uh, see if, if any of them have anything to add. So if you need to follow up, email me the question at webinars at APS.org. Uh, and I guess with that, we'll, we'll wrap up. Thanks again so much to our panel of grad students and postdocs, um, you guys. We so appreciate your taking the time to answer our questions. And I guess with that, uh, we'll uh, go ahead and uh, sign off. Like I said, we hope you'll join us next time. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>